I hate to be the one to tell you this, but once again, you've been lied to about Warhammer 40k. And whether you're a newcomer or a grimdark veteran like myself, there's a 100% chance that you currently believe something in your heart of hearts that just isn't true. And by the end of this video, we're going to have cleared up seven of the biggest misconceptions within 40k's lore that you, or perhaps somebody you know, probably believes. We're going to be talking about how the Adeptus Mechanicus is not only much smarter than people give them credit for, but also how their kooky beliefs actually make way too much sense. We're going to get to the bottom of whether or not life for every single person living within the Imperium is actually as horrifically depressing as we've been told, or if once again we've been lied to and their lives are secretly awesome. And we're going to dive into the phenomena of how all too often ridiculously complex and nuanced factions end up becoming a caricature of themselves. And the people that are to blame for this may not be who you think they are. We're going to talk about all that and a whole lot more in this video, as due to the fact that 40k's lore is so ridiculously vast, it's impossible for any one person to have read it all. Meaning that since all of us are operating with an incomplete picture of the story, we as the community have generated way too many misconceptions to fill in those gaps. But before we get started, I gotta tell you all about my latest obsession. I've been playing this amazing game that's available right now for free on both mobile and PC. It not only has jaw-dropping graphics, but also over 800 unique champions to collect and battle with. The game has brutal boss battles, deep tactical gameplay, and both intense PvE and PvP content. If you haven't already guessed by now, I'm talking about Raid Shadow Legends, the sponsor of this video, who is celebrating their 5-year anniversary with a crazy amount of giveaways for new players. Download the game for free today by clicking on my link in the description or by scanning my QR code here on the screen. When you do, you'll get some insane bonuses worth $50, including the epic champion Lady Atessa, 500k silver, and more. Plus, after downloading with my link in the description of this video, and after using the promo code FESTIVAL5, you'll get another epic champion Tyrell, and an endless amount of other rewards. I swear I'm not salty, but I do kind of wish this offer was around when I first started playing. Raid has changed a lot over the years, so even if you haven't played since 2021, it's a completely different game now. They've added a ton of new features, like the 4v4 Live Arena, a whole new rarity of champions, Mythical Champions, and the Cursed City, a massive PvE mode with a hundred stages to complete. Raid is celebrating their anniversary with the Festival of Creation, a month-long party with events, tournaments, summon boosts, free gifts, and so much more, including a fusion event for brand new legendary Armands the Magnificent. The event runs from March 7th until March 22nd, so don't miss out. What are you waiting for? Download Raid now and join the party using my link in the description, and I'll see you in-game. Big thanks to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video. Number 7. Warhammer Fantasy and 40k take place in the same universe This is one of those classic misconceptions that's been around for as long as Warhammer 40k has existed, and specifically, it's one that I see a lot with new people who got into 40k through one of the fantasy video games, namely Vermintide or the Total War series. The basic idea is that Warhammer 40k is simply the future of Warhammer Fantasy, that the world that Warhammer Fantasy takes place in is simply a single planet in the 40k galaxy, but it either takes place in the past or they haven't developed space travel yet, and thus the larger storyline has yet to unfold. There are some who believe that the world depicted in Warhammer Fantasy is simply Earth, the planet that will become Holy Terra in the 41st millennium. And this idea makes a lot of sense if you look at the landmass of Warhammer Fantasy, because it do be looking suspiciously like Earth. So a couple of things. First and foremost, this isn't true. Games Workshop has been very clear with us from the beginning that Warhammer Fantasy and its sequel Age of Sigmar and Warhammer 40k are completely separate franchises. They share a lot of the same characters, themes, and factions, but they do not exist in a shared universe, even when you try to factor in something like the warp and its shenanigans. However, the interesting part about this to me is that Warhammer 40k kinda is Warhammer Fantasy in space. This is how it was originally pitched to us in the early days. What would happen if all of these factions in Warhammer Fantasy suddenly found themselves in the year 40,000? And that's exactly what it was in its earliest incarnation, until over the years, 40k ended up taking on its own identity. That's why we see chaos in both franchises. It's why we have characters like Archaon and Abaddon serving essentially the same role and basically being the same character. It's why you have factions that are basically identical to each other. 
the Craftworld Eldar and the High Elves, the Dark Eldar and the Dark Elves, the Orcs and the Orcs, the Dwarves and the Leagues of Votan, the Ogres and the Ogrin, the Ratlings and the Halflings, and of course, Humanity and the Skaven. The list just goes on and on. At the end of the day, other than a few Easter eggs and some similarly named factions, there's nothing that binds them together. There's no definitive concrete link that says that they exist in the same universe. And even though they're both called Warhammer, they're completely separate franchises. Number six, the Emperor created 21 Primarchs. It's true that everybody's journey into 40K's lore is different, but for a lot of us, the first thing that we learn about the Primarchs is that there's 18 of them. Then we later find out that there were actually 20, but all records of two of them have been wiped from existence. Sometime after that, we start looking into the Alpha Legion, and we find out that the 20th Primarch is actually a set of twins, Alpharius and Omegon, meaning that in total there are 21 Primarchs. Now, on the surface, there's nothing wrong with this statement. This is factually correct. But this little factoid has always personally kind of rubbed me the wrong way. It's used pretty often as this gotcha statement within the community. I've seen it on forums across the internet, throughout many a comment section, and on several occasions even in real life at my local game store. Somebody will say something along the lines of the Emperor created 20 Primarchs, and a whole bunch of people will jump out of the woodwork to um actually them and say that he created 21. Asterisk 21 is the 40k community's equivalent of correcting somebody's lack of an apostrophe in the word there. Now, I'll be honest, I'm probably including this one on the list because I get corrected in my own comment section over and over whenever I say that the Emperor created 20 Primarchs. But here's a fun little additional fact. The Emperor did not create Omegon. He did not create 21 Primarchs. He only created 20. Omegon's origin is a bit more complicated. This was all revealed to us in Alpharius's Primarch novel, Head of the Hydra. I don't want to spoil too much of this book, just the parts that are relevant to Omegon's story, as the novel was great, and if you have any interest in the Alpha Legion or Alpharius as a character, you should definitely check it out. But here's the gist. Although we had been told that Horus was the first Primarch to have been discovered, it turns out that this isn't exactly true. It had been Alpharius who was first. He had been scattered into the warp just like all of his brothers, but rather than being spit out halfway across the galaxy, his pod ended up on Terra. He grew up within the Imperial Palace, but his existence was kept secret. His entire life, he felt this strange calling, something tugging at his soul out beyond the stars. He never really knew what this was, but after he had grown and had been placed in charge of the precursor to his legion, he decided to seek it out and solve this mystery once and for all. When he finally reaches it, it's like looking in a mirror. He's looking at somebody that looks exactly like him. But it's so much deeper than that. It's not simply a long lost twin. He quite literally was looking at himself, as if his soul had been split between two bodies. Now this person introduces himself as Omegon, and they have a pretty insightful conversation. Omegon tells him of his origins, of the barren world that he had landed on, and how he only managed to escape when pirates visited it to loot the ruins of a long-dead civilization. Omegon had an incredible mind, and even at a young age, he was able to determine that he had most likely been made in a laboratory, as the pod he had landed in clearly wasn't designed for gestation. So he knew that he came from somewhere else, someone had created him, but he didn't know who or why. As he traveled throughout the stars, he came into contact with other human settlements where he would stay for a period of time before continuing on his journey. From these people, he heard about the Imperium and someone they referred to as the Emperor. Now he determined that this must have been the person who made him, but again, he still didn't know why. Now Alpharius tells Omegon everything that he knows, but his twin points out that there's one key detail he's missing, that after everything he's told him, there's no mention of his father ever even acknowledging his existence. The Emperor had told Alpharius that there were 19 others like him out there and that they would eventually all be uncovered one after the other. But Omegon's existence doesn't seem to be something that the Emperor knows about. Alpharius doesn't really have an answer for this and tells him that their father was full of secrets and that Omegon very well may have been one of them. But Omegon poses a different theory. When we were scattered, we must have been done so through the warp. It is the only known manner in which objects could have been moved so far so quickly. We do not truly understand the warp, but it is not like the material universe in any way. The navigators refer to it as the Sea of Souls. Indeed. What if, when we went into the warp, there was only one of us, but when we came out? You are suggesting that we were duplicated in some way. Duplicated? Split? I have no certainty. Merely guesswork but I know that you are part of me. As you say, we are one soul in two bodies. 
that would mean our father did not know of you, that no one knows of you outside of the Legion. I can think of uses for that fact, even once we reveal ourselves. When we reveal ourselves? You intend to keep me secret from our brothers, our father, or you keep me secret from them. The Alpha Legion will need their Primarch to be visible publicly at some point. Half of them look like us anyways. One member of the Legion is the Primarch. All the others are just one of many. Number 5. The Adeptus Mechanicus is not very intelligent and their fear of innovation is holding humanity back. The tech priests of the Adeptus Mechanicus have gotten a bad rap for being something of a pack of techno shaman, individuals that keep ancient machinery working simply by praying to them and conducting sacred mechanical rituals rather than actually having any kind of real understanding of how all of the components of a machine work in tandem with one another. And although there are elements of this in play, the reality of the situation is that the Adeptus Mechanicus, on the whole, is ludicrously intelligent and capable of some truly remarkable feats of engineering. They just don't go about it in the same way that we would. Key amongst their strange views is the abolishment of innovation in all of its forms. They see innovation as tech heresy, that to be an innovator is to be someone who thinks they know better than their ancestors from the dark age of technology. Individuals that were capable of building all kinds of ludicrous machines that would seem like magic to the people in the 41st millennium. These individuals are venerated by the Mechanicus as people that were directly in tune with the machine god they worship. And from our perspective, this ban on innovation is kind of ridiculous. How could innovation possibly be a bad thing? Well, let's try to get inside their head and see things from their perspective. During the Dark Age of Technology, humanity was capable of just about everything. Every disease had been cured, every scientific secret unearthed, and every single problem solved. It was the golden age of humanity and our technological zenith. Through the academic field of techno-archaeology and the recovering of ancient STCs, the Adeptus Mechanicus is able to gain access to some of these Dark Age of Technology machines, causing the Imperium's overall gross technological capabilities to make massive leaps forward, seemingly instantaneously whenever a new one is unearthed. Could the Mechanicus theoretically reach the same level of technological genius on their own through innovation? Of course, humanity has done it before, and they could certainly do it again. But here's the thing, it would take a lot longer to get there, and more importantly, the path of innovation is fraught with disaster and unspeakable evil. Every time somebody tries to innovate in a different direction, they run the risk of playing with powers they do not fully comprehend, and thus they court disaster. A person could seek to innovate on a nuclear reactor and get their calculations wrong and end up dooming an entire city. A scientist could be attempting to study and understand a virus or pathogen in search of a cure, only to instead make it even more lethal and end up losing control over it. An individual may come up with a new type of warp drive that on the surface seems safer and more efficient, only for a hundred years later a critical flaw is discovered that was unthinkable during its construction and the thousands of ships that have been equipped with the new device begin to self-destruct, sending untold millions to their death out in the void. What of the worlds that rely on outdated equipment to manufacture oxygen for billions of people? What happens if they get something wrong and end up killing an entire world? What if the individual is attempting to cut corners on purpose to save resources? What if they've been paid off by an individual with malicious intent or they themselves harbor such views? And most damning of all, what if their innovation comes in the form of experimenting with chaos or Xenos technology, something that time and time again has proven to be inconceivably dangerous? In the video game Rogue Trader, there's a character named Pascal, who not only is the all-around best boy, but he's got a line of dialogue that gives us a lot of insight into the dogmatic traditions of the Adeptus Mechanicus. He says that many would point to their creed as restrictive and archaic, and in a sense, he agrees. He understands why somebody would think like that. But at the end of the day, the laws enforced by the Mechanicus when it comes to innovation and the reverse engineering of alien technology exist for a reason that they have seen the horrors that such actions can court, and their creed ultimately keeps humanity safe. And at the end of the day, the humans that came before them already figured all of this stuff out. They did all of the innovating and paid the price for their curiosity thousands of times over throughout human history. Why spend more time and more lives to get to a better warp drive when you can simply utilize an STC to get one a thousand times better than anything you'll be able to come up with within the next thousand years? So in conclusion, the Adeptus Mechanicus is a lot more intelligent than people tend to give them credit for. 
They're moving the technological capabilities of humanity forward by looking backwards. And they're able to do this at a much faster and safer rate than if they tried to innovate themselves. So when you think about it, their beliefs actually do make a lot of sense in the context of 40K. Number four, the Space Marines are the primary fighting force of the Imperium. When most people get into Warhammer, they often incorrectly assume that the Space Marines are the primary fighting force of the Imperium. And honestly, it's not difficult to see where this idea comes from, as they are ridiculously overrepresented in just about every single facet of 40K. From the tabletop game, to the models, to the novels, to the video games, Games Workshop's complete and utter obsession with them is a meme in and of itself. In the grand scheme of the grimdark future, the Space Marines are actually said to be pretty rare. There's only around a million of them across a thousand chapters, compared to the million worlds of the Imperium that has a population that's said to either be in the quadrillions or the quintillions, depending upon which source you're looking at. The vast majority of civilians living within the Imperium have never seen a space marine in real life. They are, in a quite literal sense, figures of myth and legend, and their title as the Emperor's Angels of Death is figurative but seen in a literal sense by the vast majority of mankind. If the Emperor is their god, then the Space Marines that are beings that have transcended humanity and were crafted with God's own hands, they're viewed in much the same way that a person of faith in the real world would look at an actual angel. Most people will go their life seeing depictions of the Space Marines in the storybooks they read when they're children, and then later depicted as statues and in frescoes in the cathedrals they'll visit throughout their life. But to actually witness a Space Marine to see one in the flesh would be a profoundly religious experience for most people. The Space Marines are outnumbered by every single Imperial fighting force, with the exception of the Adeptus Custodes and highly specialized groups that are not in themselves something that we would classify as a fighting force, like the Assassinorum or the Inquisition. There are dozens of times more Sisters of Battle than Space Marines, vastly more members of the Imperial Navy, legions of Skitari warriors, the list just goes on and on. The actual main fighting force of the Imperium is the Astra Militarum, and it's not even close. Now, trying to get an exact figure on just how many guardsmen are out there is kind of difficult to do, as Games Workshop doesn't like giving exact numbers. But based upon which source you're looking at, it could be anywhere from 1 to 30 trillion active guardsmen, meaning they outnumber the Space Marines anywhere from 1 million to 30 million to 1. And when it comes to reinforcements, it's a lot easier to replace a human soldier than a superhuman Space Marine. In fact, there's kind of a misconception about how the Space Marines operate as a whole in comparison to something like the Guard. The Astra Militarum is the overwhelming fury of the Imperium given form, that can grind out any possible threat that would seek to prey upon mankind no matter where it appears. They are stationed throughout the entirety of the Imperium's territory, and through sheer overwhelming numbers and brutal tenacity, and a tasteful disregard for human life, are able to outright obliterate just about any threat. The Space Marines, on the other hand, exist more like an elite fighting force that can accomplish grandiose missions with an army of a much smaller footprint. If the Astra Militarum is the Emperor's hammer, then the Space Marines are kind of like his scalpel, a lethally sharp device that can go in and excise a threat while utilizing vastly less resources, doing less overall collateral damage, and occupying a much smaller footprint. Although Space Marines operate on their own and pursue their own objectives quite frequently, when it comes to all-out war, it is vastly more common to see them utilized as a supplement to a much larger human fighting force. Despite how powerful the Space Marines are, the reality is that due to their limited numbers, they can't be everywhere all at once, and thus the majority of the fighting done by humanity is accomplished by regular old men and women that are ready to lay down their lives in defense of mankind. Number three, life is miserable for everyone living in the Imperium. If there's one thing that everybody knows about 40K is that in the grimdark future, it, everything sucks. It's in the opening paragraphs of just about every single Warhammer novel, that to be a man in such times is to live under the bloodiest regime imaginable. Most of humanity is crammed into massively overpopulated hive cities, where they're treated like nothing more than a cog in the Imperial war machine. They'll most likely inevitably be worked to death, their body then being dragged away by the corpse guilders to be turned into corpse starch that will nourish a new generation of indentured servants. And if at any point they try to break away from this system, they'll be labeled as a criminal or a heretic and lobotomized into a servitor. But here's the thing, this isn't 100% accurate, and life is actually really good for a pretty large portion of the population, or at the very least, really good by 40k standards. 
There have been dozens of novels in the past, like the Inquisitor series by Dan Abinett or all of the Warhammer crime novels, that give us a depiction of what it's really like to live in an imperial city. And what we see is something that, although is certainly not great by our real-world standards, is far less hopelessly grimdark than we've been led to believe. Imperial citizens have been shown to frequently visit their favorite bars, have sporting teams that they root for, keep all kinds of strange hobbies, and there are even well-documented holidays celebrated throughout the galaxy, like Sanguinella, that commemorates the Primarch Sanguinius' sacrifice, and is basically like 40k's version of Christmas. In fact, in the Ravener trilogy, many of the events throughout the book show us all kinds of different interesting locations that Imperial citizens can use to blow off steam. Whether they be full-fledged circuses and carnivals, where all kinds of exotic beasts from all over the galaxy are flown in to entertain guests, we're shown scenes of Imperial citizens going to art or history museums, and in one particularly fun scene in the Bequin novels, we even get to see inside of an Imperial shop, a strange little oddity store that has a collection of absolutely ancient toys from Old Earth, one of them being made to resemble a historical Russian rocket. On a lot of these worlds, life resembles something more akin to, say, the cyberpunk franchise. The overall macro setting sucks, and times aren't particularly great for most people, but they work normal enough jobs, have enough funds to feed and raise their families, and have enough free time to enjoy themselves. As Imperial citizens move up the economic ladder, things get considerably better. For the richest inhabitants of the Imperium, nothing is off limits. Many of them live lives of absolute lavish luxury, complete with palatial estates or a ludicrously splendid spire at the absolute peak of a hive city. But this shouldn't really come as a surprise that the wealthiest people live completely different lives than everyday folks. It's the same today as it is in the grimdark future. All of the worlds found throughout the Imperium are different. Living on an agri-world, for example, may not be an easy existence, but it's considerably less dangerous than being born into the lower class on a hive world. Likewise, if you end up being born on a feudal night world, you won't be exposed to a lot of technology, but growing up there, you'll live a humble and happy life, where you can live off of the fruits of your own labor, raise your family in a safe environment under the protection of the ruling nobles, and even own your own property and land. Here's the thing though, when we're talking about whether or not life sucks for the average imperial citizen, we do have to take population density into account, and by far, the hive worlds are where the vast majority of human beings live. If you were to roll the dice on being born in the year 42,000, you've got like a 90% chance that this is where you're going to end up, and it's pretty damn statistically unlikely that you'll be born into the upper class. Life isn't necessarily great for these people, especially if they're a mutant or a psyker. But again, even though this is the larger portion of the population, it's not the case for everybody. And I know what you're thinking. If this is true and life isn't as bleak and miserable for everyone as we've been led to believe, then why isn't this something that ever really comes up in the lore? And the short answer is that it does sometimes, but the more nuanced answer is that regular people going about their regular lives just isn't very important for the vast majority of 40k's stories. This is Warhammer after all. It's an age of endless war, and bombastic over-the-top grimdark action is the main draw for this franchise. Because war and combat are center stage for the vast majority of 40k stories, our primary lens that we experience this universe through is through all of its action stars and war heroes. When everyday citizens do show up, it's normally so they can be killed in their hundreds of thousands to amplify the stakes of any given conflict, artificially making it bigger, more grim, and grandiose. It's only when we read those few and far between smaller stories that have much lower stakes that we get a more normalized depiction of civilian life. A depiction that, although rarely focused on, is happening in the background across the galaxy for trillions of people. So in conclusion, it's a misconception that life sucks for everybody in the grimdark future. It only really sucks for most people. The fact that life is pretty bleak and hopeless is definitely one of the fundamental pillars that 40k is built upon. But the franchise has evolved a lot over the last three decades, and it's expanded to the point where we've been given a lot of insight into worlds, populations, and societies that deviate enough from this that it's no longer an accurate blanket statement. Number two, the Primaris Marines are replacing the firstborn Space Marines. I touched on this one relatively recently in my Why Did Everybody Hate Primaris Marines video, so in order not to be retreading too much ground, I'll keep it brief. 
But there's a common misconception about how the Primaris Marines are replacing the firstborn Space Marines. And in fairness, the reason this belief is so prevalent is because this is how the Primaris were first introduced to us. They were these brand new Marines that seemingly came out of nowhere. They were bigger, faster, and stronger than their firstborn predecessors and were better in every conceivable way. Going forward, all new Marines that were created would be made into Primaris Marines, meaning it was only a matter of time before all the firstborn ended up dying off and were completely replaced. Something that was exacerbated even further because at the time, Games Workshop intended to jump the story forward several hundred years, but ended up reining that back in to only about 15 years with the re-release of the Plague War series. Needless to say, this rubbed a lot of people the wrong way and was the reason why so many people had a violent negative reaction to the Primaris Marines when they first came out. But here's the thing, the Primaris Marines are not necessarily replacing the Firstborn in the same way that most people believe. There's a bit more nuance to it than that. Along with the introduction of the Primaris Marines, we were also introduced to the concept of crossing the Rubicon, an experimental procedure wherein a Firstborn Marine could be upgraded into a Primaris. The only problem was, this surgery was incredibly dangerous and the majority of Marines who undertook it were not likely to survive. However, as time has gone on, this crazy invasive surgery has had its survival rate continue to climb higher and higher as they repeat it over and over and get better at it. By the most recent point in the timeline, it's incredibly rare for a firstborn to not survive the procedure. And in fact, it's considered something of a taboo if an individual of any kind of notable rank doesn't go through with it. We're at the point now where there really isn't much difference between a Firstborn and a Primaris Marine, as the vast majority of Marines in service at the current point in the timeline are Firstborn that have upgraded to be Primaris. If I was a betting man, I would say that Games Workshop is most likely going to stop drawing a distinction between the two over the next couple of years. It'll happen in the novels first, Firstborn and Primaris won't be mentioned anymore, and they'll just be called Space Marines. This will eventually make its way over to the tabletop game as the last few remaining Firstborn kits are updated. And at that point, they'll all just be Space Marines again. You just have those who have already undergone the procedure and those who will do so in the future. And considering just how long it took Games Workshop to move the storyline forward in the real world, we were at the Battle of Cadia for like 20 years, I don't think we're going to have a considerable jump forward in the timeline that would make it so all of the Firstborn have died off. And besides that, at this exact point in the timeline, you can have a full Primaris army without a single Firstborn model and say that they're all Firstborn, and that is 100% in line with the current lore. The creation of Space Marines may have evolved, but the Primaris are not going to be replacing our precious Firstborn anytime soon. If anything, what's happening is our Firstborns are just getting a little bit more powerful. Number 1. The Grand Flanderization of Warhammer 40k's Factions so I'll be honest, this was a topic that I thought about splitting off into its own video, as there's a lot of layers to it, but in the name of being more concise and not going on too many tangents, I'm going to tell you just what you need to know. Because Warhammer's lore is so titanic in scale, there isn't a single person alive that has read all of it, which means that every single one of us, yours truly included, is operating with an incomplete picture of it. On one hand, this is actually kind of awesome. It means that every single one of us has a completely unique perspective on this universe, as we're all operating with a different mismatch of information, and thus we all have something cool to bring to the table when discussing 40k's lore. However, on the other end of that spectrum, many Warhammer lore fans have a tendency to focus specifically on the things they find interesting, and then kind of sort of fill in the blanks for everything else. When we first start getting into 40k's lore, it's not uncommon for most of us to gravitate towards one, two, or maybe a small handful of factions and characters. We then go on to learn everything there is to know about them, and pick up little bits of information here and there about all of the other factions and characters, normally from secondhand sources, be they lore videos, hearsay at our local store, on a discussion board somewhere, or admittedly, far more commonly, uh, through memes. And don't get me wrong, I love me a good 40k meme. The 40k community created 5 jokes 40 years ago and never even attempted to make another one. Five jokes to rule them all, so to speak. The Dark Angels are traitors, everything that the Orcs believe becomes real, the Tau are weeaboo space communists, the Adeptus Mechanicus likes to f toasters, and Spacebook says no. Now, aside from the memes, we have fast and loose single-sentence explanations for what a faction is all about. The Iron Warriors are obsessed with siege warfare. The Imperial Fists like to build fortresses. The Ultramarines are sticklers for doing things by the book. The Death Corps of Krieg is all suicidal, etc, etc. 
These memes and simple explanations exist as a shorthand to explain complicated subject matter in a short and precise format that gets the general idea across without the need for a three-hour lecture and a tasteful PowerPoint presentation. Most of this shorthand when it comes to factions specifically is derived from a small handful of characteristics displayed by the group in question that makes them stand out as unique. The major problem is that this information gets repeated by the community over and over ad nauseum, to the point where newcomers and even veterans like myself end up believing that this small sliver of a faction's personality is all they are. What before was just one peculiar fact about a faction or character now becomes the entirety of their existence. One facet of their personality ends up ballooning in the eyes of the audience to the point where it becomes their entire identity. In a sense, the faction ends up becoming a caricature of itself. And more often than not, this caricature, aside from being oversimplified to the point of being completely inaccurate, is often not very positive and paints a pretty boring picture of said faction. Meaning that sadly, a lot of people may never end up giving a faction or character the time of day, even if in reality, they would actually really enjoy reading about them, because they're off-put by that initial first impression that's sadly kinda hard to shake. For me personally, I thought for years that the White Scars were just a bunch of speed-obsessed space marines that were entirely characterized by their love of motorcycles. As an orc enthusiast, they just seemed like a far less interesting version of the Speed Freaks. I didn't change my mind until I started reading the Horus Heresy and found out that they were actually one of the most interesting and genuinely refreshing legions to read about. Literally every single time a White Scar legionnaire showed up in the story, I got really excited because they always had something interesting to say or add to a scenario. I was continuously left thinking that I couldn't believe I had written these guys off for so many years. They're amazing and the Khan is easily my favorite loyalist Primarch. That initial shorthand information that I had received through the community about them was just really off-putting to the point where I never gave them a chance. Now, let me know if this has ever happened to you. Has there ever been a faction or character in 40K that you thought was stupid originally until you read a book about them and then found out they were amazing? And fun fact, there's actually a name for the phenomena of a complex character or faction becoming less complex over time, and it's referred to as flanderization. If you're unfamiliar with it, flanderization is what happens when a character in a story or franchise that is originally introduced to us as being well-rounded with a few particularly noteworthy characteristics that makes them stand out is slowly warped over time by the writers as they continuously make those interesting traits more and more prominent until eventually they end up dominating their entire personality. The concept is named after the character Ned Flanders in The Simpsons, who was originally introduced as the polar opposite of Homer Simpson, a well-rounded neighbor that seemed to have everything going for him. However, as the show went on, the writers kept making the fact that he was a Christian a more prominent part of his personality until his religious side was the only defining feature he had left. What makes the flanderization of Warhammer so particularly interesting and unique to me, though, is that opposed to flanderization in other franchises, with Warhammer, it's not the fault of the Black Library authors. It's quite the opposite, in fact. They're putting out two to three new novels every month, not to mention all of the new codexes, campaign supplements, white dwarves, etc., etc. It is an extensive and exhausting level of lore that is impossible for not only the casual fan, but even dedicated lore junkies like myself to stay on top of. Ironically, it is we as the community that have played into the flanderization of all of the factions and characters that we find so interesting. What we often do, whether we realize it or not, is anthropomorphize factions that consist of thousands of unique individuals with different competing philosophies into a single homogenous entity a single character in the story. We say things like the Imperium believes X, or all of the Tau want Y, or the ultimate objective of chaos is Z. It makes it easy and helps us better understand their place in the universe, but it's ultimately reductive and paints an inaccurate picture of what the faction is all about. The Imperium controls a million worlds and is home to quintillions of people and has an incalculable amount of sub-factions within it. Whether they be their own independent nations on any given world, a subsect of the Ecclesiarchy, an obscure Ordo of the Inquisition, a Space Marine chapter, etc., etc., there is no single blanket statement that you can make about the Imperium that is in any way, shape, or form accurate. However, that hasn't stopped its flanderization. Now, it's not entirely our fault. As I said before, no sane human being can learn everything there is to know about 40K. It's kind of what makes this franchise so endearing to me. There's always something new to learn about. 
But whereas I have a lot of respect for Games Workshop as a company, specifically for their ability to recognize the value in world building, even though it doesn't result in short-term profits, a uh, quick side note, Black Library in its entirety makes up less than 1% of Games Workshop's annual revenue. That is a fact. You can look it up in their earnings reports. Over with Hasbro and Magic the Gathering, they tried to do something similar. They started putting out magic novels. However, they never really made the profits that Hasbro was expecting. So they started putting out less and less of them over time until today, the last one to have been released was in 2019. They had plans for multiple trilogies after that, but quietly canceled them. World building and intricate storytelling be damned. But anyways, back with Games Workshop. The other side of that coin is my absolute hatred for how they make the lore so inaccessible to most people that aren't willing to pay ridiculously inflated prices. Because if you miss out on those first print runs, or worse, they end up getting scalped, a lot of the times you're just shit out of luck. And that's just for novels. When it comes to dedicated background books, it's even worse. They only print a limited amount of these things, charge a ridiculously high price tag, and then just conveniently don't put out a permanently available PDF of said book in order to help drive up that FOMO even harder. It's not a perfect solution, but it sure would make the lore more accessible to everyone that isn't willing to blow hundreds of dollars on physical copies if they put out permanently available PDFs of every single book they produce. Games Workshop, you do it with all of your novels, you can do it with the background books as well. In my mind, there's honestly no excuse for this. Quick side tangent, but for me personally, I just found out a few months ago that there was this background book called The Librazenologist that goes into depth on all of the random beasts and aliens found throughout 40k's lore. It has all these really cool illustrations, and the whole thing is written from the perspective of a rogue trader that is seeking to catalog all of these bizarre beasties. And let me just say, as somebody who likes collecting RPG bestiaries and loves making lore videos about obscure monsters and aliens, this was 100% up my alley and I was super excited about it. Only to find out that it had been a super limited release, and of course there's no PDF. So what do I do? I go check it out on eBay, and sure enough, it's $400. Games Workshop, I don't ask for much, but could you pay an intern like a hundred bucks to spend a day just scanning all of the pages in this thing and make it a PDF, please? There's no excuse for this. What is the point of putting all of the obscure lore into one easy to read source and then making it so nobody can get their hands on this thing? So anyways, in conclusion, without going on any more tangents, most of the simplistic views that we have of a lot of the factions are aggressively oversimplified to the point where they're just not accurate at all. And the flanderization of all of the 40k factions is something that, although widespread, exists mostly in the mind of the community. The Tau are not weeaboo space communists, the Night Lords are just as capable of fighting as every other group of space marines even without fear tactics, the Dark Angels are an intricate and complex chapter with a rich history and are not characterized only by their obsession with the Fallen, etc, etc. But what do you think of all this? Are there any 40k factions that you think have been flanderized too much by the community? Do you think I'm wrong and Games Workshop definitely plays into the flanderization? I'll admit, after I recorded this segment, I did go back and look at all of the most recent orc books to have come out, and they're all by Mike Brooks, and they're all comedy orcs. And don't get me wrong, I love me some comedy orcs, but I might have to do a follow-up video on how Games Workshop is just as guilty as we are when it comes to flanderization. Because back in the day, the orcs used to be terrifying. Nowadays though, they're more 40k's comedy relief faction. What about the Adeptus Mechanicus? Do you agree that they get a bad rap and they're smarter than most people give them credit for? Or is their reputation well deserved? What's your opinion on the Primaris Marines? Do you love them, hate them, or do you feel kind of indifferent about them? What are some other big misconceptions that the community has about 40k? I kind of want to make this an ongoing series and put out another one of these every couple of months or so, where we set the record straight on all of the misinformation floating around the community. Also, don't forget to check out Raid Shadow Legends using my link in the description. Sorry if the audio is a little off in this one. As I said in my community post just recently, my old studio is no more because my local store shut down. And as of right now, I'm kind of sort of in the middle of switching to a new one. So there's going to be some growing pains over the next month or so. But once I get through this weird transitionary period, I'll be making more videos than ever before. Anyways, big thanks to everyone who supports the work that I do, and I'll catch y'all in the next one.